Bentley High Amp Munich 2023. Next to me, Garth Powell from AudioQuest. And we had some email conversations the past couple of months, maybe, uh, about the whole digital uh, research we're doing uh, concerning coaxial cables and, and stuff like that. Um, I'm glad you, you, you take the time to talk to us. Pleasure. Um, well, let, let's start with the basics of a coaxial cable. What, what can you talk about? Uh, what, what can you tell me about that? Well, for the coaxial cable, what's it being used for? In this particular case for digital, that will be for the um, uh, SBDIF uh, technology. Yep. And for that particular protocol, um, you're going to have to have a very specific impedance and it's going to have to deal with high frequencies very linearly with as little distortion as possible and with as little induced noise as possible. Then, the, uh, but because this particular standard, when it was originally developed, needed to be for consumers, was perceived as needed to be affordable and expensive, even though it's being used in the audiophile world with BNC connectors for incredibly expensive uh, word clocks and digital processors. It also needed to serve a very inexpensive AVR and other equipment as such. So the standard was essentially designed around an RCA connector that is not anywhere close to the stated impedance and never will be. It, and that stated that, that stated impedance is 75 ohms. Yeah, because you have two versions, like 50 and 75, in the in the professional world. Yes, and and in reality, if you look at an RCA, it will never be a perfect impedance. It has to do with the dielectric or the insulator um, coefficient, as well as the spacing between the center and the the low or the center being the positive. But the, the reality of it is, is that although it follows a range from audiophile to the most simple basic RCA connectors, they're much closer to 50 than they're, they'll never make 75. Yeah. It's impossible. Now you can get BNCs, which is a professional yeah. broadcast standard. Oh, you can get those in a number of different impedances where they change the, um, the spacings and they change the insulator. And those, particularly back to the analog days, some of that equipment, if you were off by five ohms, you would have nothing but snow. <laughs> so that, you know, I, I learned as a, as, a, as a kid being an apprentice engineer how important that, that characteristic impedance had to be. Yeah. But it's much looser in the audio world. For word clocks, they tend to want to be 75 ohms pretty tight. And that always is going to be a BNC for that reason. But anytime you see an RCA connector, it's anyone's guess. What, 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 I, that, that's what I noticed. When, when we were measuring on our, uh, we use a Wavecrest, uh, Wavecrest as, you, as you probably know by now. Um, as soon as you swap a cable, you see a difference. That's obvious. But the difference between uh, good and bad cables is pretty huge. Well, what would that do with a uh, word clock, for example? Uh, you're not, you're going to have jitter and yeah. you're going to have a number of different problems. You're going to have reflections, you know, all of these things are distortions essentially, yeah. you know, like the engineers, you know, like have specific terminologies and so forth that they use. And every time we have a new technology, we decide it's, you know, like therefore an opportunity as engineers to design a new vocabulary of new <laughs> words that you don't know. So I feel superior to you, but in <laughs> fact, it's all variations on the same thing. You know, it, it's sort of like, like the difference between digital recording and analog recording. It's sort of like, okay, you know, like what's the problem with analog? You modulate the, you know, like above the, the, the highest you know, signal levels, everything is, is nothing but distortion. You know, like then you do with the corollary, you know, like zeros and ones. Oh, everything will be perfect now. Nope, not really. Now all of a sudden the very modulated signals are far cleaner than they ever were at analog. And now as we go down in volume level, we have about a bit left and it's not nearly as good as analog was. What's better? <laughs> Anyone's guess. Depends on the application, depends what you're trying to do. The more you know about the engineering that's involved in all of these things, the more you want to go, ah! <laughs> so essentially, it's a situation where you're always chasing after um, a level of perfection you're not really going to achieve. So it's trying to figure out what of all of these technical considerations are going to make the biggest difference in your application that you're going to notice. Do we chase after frequency response? Do we chase after jitter? Yeah. Do we chase after noise? Uh, I know that the characteristic impedance of SP diff under the RCA standards, not very good. So I want to minimize the reflections, but I'm not a broadcaster. I'm not running k kilometers of cable. No. So in a situation like this, I'm not too worried about that. I just want to be reasonable to meeting the original SPDIF standard. 
Uh, my, in fact, in fr there's a good excuse because of the connectors. I might want to lower the characteristic impedance of the cable a bit, which we've done on some of our models yeah. for, for that standard, but not, not for word clocks. Yeah. So then, you know, like jitter is going to matter, but if we're getting down to, okay, well, this one's got, you know, like a, uh, this small amount, and this one's got a fraction more. I'm not so worried about that as something that um, isn't conventionally measured because it's not easy to measure with conventional equipment, and that's going to be induced noise. Yep. Induced noise is a problem. It actually can affect jitter in the overall system, not necessarily when you measure only the cable um, uh, through a, an analyzer. But, but the, <laughs> Are you talking to me now? <laughs> I'm talking about the entire industry because all, all you're doing is what we were all taught to do. It doesn't yeah. matter if it's an analog cable, if it doesn't matter if it's a digital cable, there's there's a machine, you know, like that'll put out, you know, like frequency that'll put out this the, the correct signal and show you this. Yeah. And that's important because as you know, that will show you this cable doesn't have a fighting chance. This one looks pretty good. But how do you determine the difference between 10 different cables that all look like they meet the standard reasonably well, well. That, that, that's so different. That, that that's the question i was getting because you know what the, the the good cables are actually pretty close to each other yes. i mean they're all within one or one and a half pico picoseconds which is nothing i mean that that's really close yeah. and still they sound different yes. and in fact analogs no different and no. there's a good reason for this because yeah. you know like um, if you look at the standards for an analog interconnect um everybody you know at this you know, like a particular, you know, like a high-end um, festival, we'll talk about how incredibly pure the conductor is, how, you know, like um, uh, exotic the insulating material is, how carefully we, you know, like have dealt with um, grounding or shielding and so forth, and a whole other different, you know, considerations, maybe resonance and so forth. But mm -hmm. the reality of it is, is that measured the way I was taught to measure a cable in um, uh, engineering school, um, essentially, I could at audio frequencies, I could use coat hangers and get a really good response. It's yeah. easy to do. The thing is, is that that'll sound bad, but why does it sound bad? And why do those 10 cables all sound different? First of all, a digital signal is analog transmission. Yeah, absolutely. It's analog signal transmission. It's just that the signal it's carrying yeah. is packets of zeros and ones. Yeah. So it's, it's subject to the same problems as an analog cable. And even more importantly, because we haven't, you know, and really, well, figured out, there's no way we can have pure digital from beginning to end. The microphone is not digital, the, the, the um, loudspeaker is not. So at some point we have to convert from DSP to analog. As soon as we convert to analog, any kind of induced noise that's riding along on the cable oh, is going to meet its match with analog. It's going to start to modulate and distort transient or modulation in particular, which we're very sensitive to, um, uh, radio frequencies versus audio frequencies. Those are, those are beats, that's distortion, that's ouch. And then the other thing that's going to happen is that at very low levels, you're going to have a masking effect because a good recording that's not slam limited for earbuds is going to have very wide dynamic range. Now, the thing about measuring conventionally is it measures way up here around zero VU, about 0.775 yeah. volts. Yeah. And the secret yeah. is whether you spend 20 euros on a cable or 20,000 euros on a cable, everybody pretty much is going to look the same up here. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. That's child's play. At 80 dBU below, at 100 dB, you know, like BU below, you know, like even negative 60, at while music, complex music waveforms are happening simultaneously, this is where the differences come in because when the noise, you know, like um, it starts to modulate, induced noise, radio frequency noise yeah. starts to modulate those low level signals, it creates a noise going to like this. And I don't want this, I want this. And further, we also want to make sure that however we dissipate the noise and drain what we can't dissipate or turn into loss of heat, yeah. we want it to be as linear as possible. Linear is just a fancy engineer's term for as even and consistent <laughs> yeah, yeah, as yeah. we can make it. We'll never achieve that, but the better off we do, the more we do this, the better off we will be. This is important because, for instance, as an engineer, if I just, you know, come up with a particular scheme or a circuit or a little, you know, like thing or a device, and I look at this thing and I say, oh my God, at 10 megahertz, I'm 90 decibels down. 
I've just conquered the world. I've gotten rid of noise. Well, you did really well at 10 megahertz. Yeah. The problem <laughs> is the there's 23 yeah, octaves yeah, yeah, of yeah. noise today, and it's getting worse as we come up with new technology. They just keep pushing the frequency out. Yeah. And so the problem is, is that you got to get them all. I would rather have less than that 90 at one frequency, yeah. but even if it's only 40, even if it's only 20, and get it across the board. Because what's going to happen is, is that this is going to affect our perception of audio frequencies and there's going to, when they have that inconsistency, the reason you want that consistency or linearity is at one set of harmonics or frequencies in my audio playback, I don't want to have, you know, like maybe a, you know, like a dissipation that's getting rid of 10 decibels of the noise and be like this. And then an octave from there, I'm down 40 decibels and I'm like this, but then a quarter octave from there, I've got a resonant, you know, like peak in my you know, dissipation scheme or filter that I used, and it's plus six, this, and then for 23 octaves, it's this, 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 and it's changing not only with frequency, but it's also oftentimes changing with amplitude and it's changing with impedance. None of these things are linear either. These kind of like frustrations that no engineer wants to deal with. We want simple answers. We want to be able to tell the sales team no, and we want to be able to go home and collect our checks and yeah. just not worry about it. So the, well, the world is not that simple, unfortunately. No, it's not, it's absolutely not. And so this is the, this is the problem. You just have to deal with a, you know, like a plethora of, of really, really bad problems and just figure out how to chip away at the majority of them as best you can and constantly be learning. Well, okay, we're investigating these cables and most of our viewers understand what we're trying to do, but there's also this mass of people that say, it's a one, it's a zero, that's it. If it works, it works and what you're measuring is just crap, it doesn't matter. What We're, we're talking about, let's like, like say, 15 minutes about noise, I, and I understand completely what you mean, but there, there's this huge group of people out there that say it's digital, it can, if it works, it works. Oh, and, and not only do they say that, but you know, like um, in many ways they're right. Zero and one is zero. Oh, you're right. I, I absolutely can guarantee you that if you measure the packets from one side of the transmission to the next, they'll be fine. They'll be fine. <laughs> they'll be fine. Maybe a little bit of jitter, but you know, can you really hear it? We're not really sure. You know, it depends on what the degree is or something like yeah, that. Yeah, no, yeah. it's not that their statement is absolutely correct. And if that's your only criteria that you're looking for, then essentially we're done and we can go home oh that would be so nice and easy it would be unfortunately you know like um, uh, our ears are telling us a different story yeah. so we can't be lazy engineers and we have to figure out you know when when, when nine to ten audiophiles tell me that they are hearing something i have a choice as an engineer i can say well you're clearly delusional i need an abx test you know, like um, uh, you need to make sure that somebody isn't tricking you yeah. with clever marketing into you believing that you're hearing something that I'm influencing you to hear. Um, or you can say, wow, nine out of 10 people heard something. Maybe it would serve me as an engineer to try to understand why. But that would require some work, which most of them are not willing to do. I am. Well, it, uh, you have to admit it's pretty hard. To, to really investigate a, a situation like that, because I was a non-believer of Ethernet cables and switches as well. I mean, there are videos online that say it's, it's oh, a bunch, no. yeah. The thing about this is that I find it situational because uh, at, my pri at my previous employer, I worked, you know, like with a team of, yeah, you know, like, yeah, for Furman. I worked, and it was also Panamax towards the end, and I yeah. worked with a team of really good engineers. We all got along. I really, really liked them. But believe me, I was the only audiophile, yeah. and I got scorn and ridicule for it daily, yeah. despite the fact that we all respected each other. They just thought the whole thing was crazy. Yeah. They didn't want to hear any of this stuff. They didn't need to hear. We had a million euro, yeah, you know, like, um, yeah, we had a million euro laboratory we could measure. We don't need to listen when we can measure, um, as I was told frequently. And, you know, again, it was always the usual, the same cliches, the same platitudes about, oh, you're being fooled by what people are telling you to hear. Oh, we need a double blind study. We need more peer review. And, but I, it's situational because what I noticed about a lot of the other engineers that I worked with, with all their experience and with all their considerable skills, and I really respected them a lot, I always noticed that when the new iPhone came out, they were the first in line and they would be at their freezing cold at one in the morning to make sure they were the first in the door with the rest of their buddies so they could show this thing off. And I wanted to make sure that they, I wanted to help them. I would ask them, 
oh my God, I need to save you from yourselves. Have you seen any peer review on the new iPhone? Is it truly better? Is the processing speed truly superior? Have you measured it yet? You know, like, um, uh, has it been peer reviewed? You know, like, um, have you done a double blind study? I hope so, because I'm really scared that you're about to blow a thousand euros. <laughs> so it's situational about what they decide to be concerned about, I find. Okay, well, we, we can talk for hours, so I'm, I'm afraid uh, we'll, we'll definitely have some contact uh, with email um, because we're still not finished with the, with the review. And we're going to do some blind tests, by the way. Not ABX, but we're going to do a blind test and see what happens. Uh, but thank you for your time and your explanation on, on cables and, and Jitter. But one, one last question. Would you uh, either use RCA or uh, BNC? Well... For a word clock, it will be BNC, yeah. and if you were taking the, um, if you were taking coaxial um, SB diff seriously, you would absolutely use coaxial. But the, or not, not coaxial. Well, excuse me, BNC for, to, for the for the coaxial cable. Now the, versus RCA. Now the problem is going to be though is that it's not up to which connector is better. It's really the fact that when you see that standard, not always, but usually, it's because the circuits have been designed to be linear yeah, yeah, at that yeah, impedance yeah, yeah. across yeah. its entire frequency spectrum. In a word clock, they know they have to get that right. In most of our consumer yeah. electronics where you see the RCA connector, trust me, it is not linear with impedance, and they didn't work that hard on it. That's a very good one, by the way. I didn't think about that. Thank you for watching, and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>